Hey there! It's Bobby, aka Paginator, and I have got a magical book review for you today. Recently, uh, Pottermore, which is the online community, official online community for all things Harry Potter, released three ebooks, collections of short stories and pieces written by Miss J.K. Rowling herself, and I read them today. I've been saying I've, I'm going to do this for quite a while now, and I think I've been delaying because I didn't want to be disappointed, And but how could I? It's J.K. Rowling, and you have to go into these ebooks knowing that they're bits and pieces of information, some about character, some about creature, some about secret, some, um, some about just different facets of the wizarding world, and so no, they're not going to be full-fledged stories, they're going to be more like a biography bit of this character, or this information that you may or may not have known about Moaning Myrtle, or, you know, so on. So, that being said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of the three books. I'm not going to go into like super detailed, like spoilery kind of information because that seems mean to do. Um, but I'll tell you, I took notes while I was reading these three books. And yeah, so I'm going to use my handy nandy notes as a guide to talk to you about what I read. The first book is, uh, the first of the three that I read was Short Stories from Hogwarts of Power, Politics, and Pesty Pols Pesky Poltergeists. So there are chapters about some different characters and different political or powerful situations, wrapping up with a chapter about our favorite poltergeist. So chapter one is all about Miss Dolores Umbridge. Now, if you can tell, I do have on a light pink shirt today that has nothing to do with Dolores Umbridge. It's just the shirt that I have on today. I also have a Time Turner necklace. That does not mean I think I'm Hermione Granger. It's just what I'm wearing. All right. So Dolores Umbridge. Um, this tells a little bit about her earlier life and growing up and, and the different stages of her career that she went through. And I have to say there wasn't anything that was too shocking in terms of her earlier life. It's like, oh yeah, that figures. I'll give you one example. Um, Dolores Umbridge had a younger brother who was a squib. Now her mother, who was a muggle, it was always blamed by both Dolores and her father for her brother not having any magical powers. So they were treated badly and the mother and the younger brother eventually left. Does that surprise me? No. It's Dolores Umbridge, awful person. Um, of course, it tells us that she's a Slytherin, and no surprise there. Um, the punishment quill that she uses on Harry um, is an invention of her own. Um, what else did we... Oh, after many of the sections, there is an additional section called J.K. Rowling's Thoughts. And one of the things she said about Umbridge was that she took partial inspiration for Umbridge's appearance um, from a teacher that she once had who used to come to class every day with this little lemon yellow bow slide in her hair like she had raided a three-year-old girl's play wardrobe. And she always remembered that. And so it's no reflection on that teacher's personality, but just the physical appearance of Dolores Umbridge and how she's pink and bows and kittens and blah 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 came partially from that teacher which I thought was interesting. Um, chapter two is Ministers for Magic and Azkaban so she gives us a timeline um, beginning at the beginning of the office of Minister for Magic which is in 1707 through the present and there were just little paragraphs of information about each Minister for Magic one of them that I it made me smile was there was one whose last name was Diggory and he was very loved and popular. Which of course makes me think of Cedric Diggory. How could it not? And the first female Minister for Magic was in 1798 and her name was Artemisia Lipkin. Interesting. During World War I, the Minister for Magic at that time forbade all the wizards and witches from joining in any of the war action. But of course, thousands of them went against him and aided the Muggles wherever they could, which I thought was just charming. Like, 
of course they're going to help. Most wizards and witches are good people. Um, in 1962, they had the first Muggleborn, Muggleborn Minister for Magic, which is, you know, 1960s, very t um, era for social change. There, there were also um, protests for squibs' rights during that time, which we learned in that chapter. And there's also a section in this chapter about Azkaban, the famous wizard prison. And it was originally an island home to a very dark wizard who sounds like he was maybe trying to become like a serial killer, or I guess he was a serial killer, because he would lure, torture, and kill muggle sailors. He would lure them to the island, who knows what kind of torture he would put them under, and kill them. So he was a serial killer, absolutely. And that's the place where the Dementors grew and developed, and it was eventually turned into a prison. And yeah, lots of things happened from that point on. And, uh, yeah. In Chapter 3, this is about Horace Slughorn and potions. So we learn a little bit more about Horace Slughorn. Nothing too earth-shattering. Again, things that make sense. Like, when he was young, as a student at Hogwarts, he also tried to collect people, like, who would be around the most prestigious or interesting wizards and had a little slug club of sort of thing as a student, but then again as a professor, which we know from reading book five. But also, she reminds us that in the Battle of Hogwarts, Slughorn is one of the professors Sorry, two giant cement trucks were driving past my house and they were quite noisy, so I was just taking a moment to be irritated with them. <laughs> um, but in the Battle of Hogwarts, Slughorn was one of the people that came leading um, rebellion to aid in the battle. And this window is really distracting. Pardon me while I close it for a minute. Sorry, that was annoying the crap out of me. <laughs> okay, so again, Slughorn kind of redeemed himself from teaching Tom Riddle how to mix make horcruxes and from being kind of just a not generally nice person to people unless he thought they were important enough um, by participating in the battle and you know kind of helped take away some of the sting of the name of Slytherin because he was a past Slytherin head of house and that kind of thing. I feel like I'm rambling and I'm sorry. Okay, potions. Um, J.K. Rowling said that she hated chemistry when she was a student, and so when she was trying to decide what subject Snape would teach, she thought, oh, what's the wizarding equivalent of chemistry? Potions. But then she ended up quite liking the research and, and developing potions and her writing and that kind of thing. So, interesting. Um, Polyjuice potions she talked a little bit about, as well as like choosing the ingredients, all of which suggested joining or duality of some kind. For example, lace wing fly, that lace suggests connection. Um, so if you know what Polyjuice Potion is used for, that makes a lot of sense. And there was a little section on cauldrons. Um, she just decided to keep them as a wizarding tool even though the mugger world doesn't use them anymore because they're handy and that's what they need to make potions. Okay, chapter four is about Quirinius Quirrell. Um, he was a Ravenclaw and, of course, a professor um, for Defense Against the Dark Arts in the book one, The Sorcerer's or Philosopher's Stone. And basically what she has to say about him is that, yeah, he was kind of an unremarkable person who wanted people to sit up and take notice, but he wasn't super malevolent or dark-hearted. He's just not strong enough to fight off Vol Voldemort when Voldemort basically possessed him and used him as kind of a temporary horcrux. Um, so she kind of made it seem like had Voldemort not chosen him, he probably wouldn't have gone on to be like an evil person. He just couldn't resist that much strength. Chapter five is about Peeves and she told some interesting things about the history of Peeves and how in the 1800s one caretaker tried a series of explosive and, and different things to get rid of Peeves and that kind of backfired and Peeves caused some damage as one might expect him to do and so they ended up coming up with a contract for him 
and he gets certain rights including a once weekly swim in the boys toilet on the ground floor and he got a new hat made by a special hat maker in Hogsmeade and yeah, funny things. Alright, so that wraps up the first of the ebooks. The second one is Hogwarts, an incomplete and unreliable guide. <laughs> And so it kind of takes us through the steps. Chapter 1 is a journey to Hogwarts, and it talks a little bit about King's Cross Station and, um, the, and J.K. Rowling writes that there is actually a real trolley st like stuck halfway through the wall in King's Cross Station if you go there today, and every time that she sees it, she just grins to herself, which I totally would if I were her. Like, she created this whole... Oh, massive fandom thing that we're all like totally so happy to be a part of now. Um, platform nine and three quarters. She knew it had to be a fraction, and when the number nine and three quarters came to her, she just really liked that because she did, and it needed to be a fraction so that it could fit in between two existing platforms at King's Cross Station. And she th says perhaps there are other fraction numbered platforms there as well. And, yeah, I'm trying to not give too many details because I really want to tell you, like, oh, she said this and this and this and this. But you can read the books for yourself. I'm, I'm trying to give more general information. All right. Then we talk a little bit about the Hogwarts Express. Before the train, students arrived at Hogwarts in all kinds of weird ways, on broomsticks, on magical creatures, and maybe even some thestrals. Who knows? Um, they tried port keys for a while, but that turned out to be kind of a mess. So the Minister for Magic at the time said, let's use some muggle transportation. We'll get a train, and if students don't want to try ride the train, they can't come to Hogwarts. So, they had to deal with using muggle transportation. Um, chapter 2 talks about the sorting, the, the hat itself, as well as hat stall, which is something that occurs when a person takes longer than five minutes to sort. McGonagall was a hat stall, and her cousin Flitwick was a hat stall, and there weren't very many. Hermione almost was a hat stall. She was about four minutes or so, but wasn't up to the five minutes to officially be declared hat stall. Um, chapter three, the castle grounds. Um, she describes the Hufflepuff common room, which is something we don't see in the books because Harry never goes there. We know it exists, but now we can have a better picture in our minds after reading that chapter. Um, the Marauder's Map, she talks a little bit about. Um, she says she kind of regrets letting Harry steal it back from um, the certain defense against the dark arts professor that took it away from him um but later on she's like okay I, I, i'm kind of glad i let him keep it because he got to walk look and see where jenny was in book seven and yeah blah 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 stop saying details i'm really sorry i have to to lecture myself um okay the great lake she talked a little bit about that and how she loved it that there was this watery magical part of the Hogwarts grounds that we didn't really get to explore until book four. Um, chapter four was lessons at Hogwarts. She talked about the school subjects and some of her possible ideas. She was going to have um, alchemy being a required subject starting from year one, but then totally changed her mind there and some other things. And she did talk about um, time turners and said, you must be careful what you invent because she ended up having to cause something to happen to all of the time turners in one of the books so that they would go away because time ta travel is a dangerous thing to mess with. Um, chapter 5 was Castle Residence. She talked about Hogwarts ghosts, um, ghosts in general in the Wizarding World. Um, the Ballad of Nearly Headless Nick was a poem that Nick composed about his beheading, which is highly entertaining. I highly read, suggest you get the ebook just for that. It's funny. Um, Hogwarts portraits, specifically Sir Duggan. And one of his um, special abilities was insane bravery, <laughs> which makes perfect sense if you know Sir Cadogan. Chapter 6, The Secrets of the Castle, um, The Mirror of Erised, Pensieves. Now this I, I either didn't know or had forgotten that wizards can have their own pensieves and they're buried with them when they're, when they're um, passed away. But the pensive that Harry uses at Hogwarts belongs to the school, so it doesn't get buried with Dumbledore. It's not Dumbledore's pensive, it's the school's pensive, and, or pensive, and that's why he can still use it after Dumbledore's gone. Um, the Philosopher's Stone, of course, um, most people know that that's a, 
a thing that was studied or tried to, um, I don't want to say invent, but tried to create it with real studies of alchemy back in the day with like the real Nicholas Flamel and that. So um, she didn't invent the Philosopher's Stone, but she did use a version of it for her fictional purposes. Um, the Sword of Gryffindor, um, the Chamber of Secrets, again, more information about that. And then that takes us to the third ebook, um, and I'm saying third, but that's just because I read it third in the order. This one might be my favorite, and it's because of chapter one. Now, the title of this ebook is Short Stories from Hogwarts of Heroism, Hardship, and Dangerous Hobbies. <music> chapter one is all about Minerva McGonagall. Now, I love Minerva McGonagall. I, I love her. But my love has deepened for her because of this book. Now, I knew from reading the, the books, like the actual series, that she had had a husband who had passed away. But either I had newly learned or had forgotten some of this other stuff. And I'm hoping that it's newly learned information because it would be sad if I forgot this stuff about her. Um, her birthday is October 4th, which is very close to mine. Mine is in the early part of October as well, which is cool. Um, but we learned some very sad and tragic things that happened to her in our earlier life, and I don't want to, again, go into all the details because you need to read it for yourself, but a lot of things that she's gone through just made me identify more with her, and the fact that she's gone through so many sad things, and that she's a teacher, and she has no children of her own, and just made me love her more, and I'm like, oh. I wish she was my teacher. <sighs> but anyway, I love McGonagall. Let's wrap up the thoughts with that. Um, and that chapter also did talk a little bit about Animaji because she was one. Chapter 2, Remus Lupin, was another heartbreaking chapter. Um, J.K. Rowling said that when she wrote his biography, she cried again because she hated that she had to do some things to him that were done in the series. Um, and she said that his lycanthropy, his werewolfness, is a metaphor for um, illnesses that have stigmas. And she mentioned things like AIDS and HIV. I would also say mental illness um, has stigmas. There's lots of things that have stigmas that go with them. Um, and that just makes me like Lupin more because he's like a symbol for people who struggle with things that people judge you on. Like, it's not his fault he got bitten by stupid grayback. Alright, um, she also talked in that chapter specifically about werewolves and in the wizarding world only witches or wizards turn into werewolves because if a muggle was bitten by a werewolf, they'd just die. Um, chapter 3 is all about Sybil Trelawney. Have you seen the pop figure that's like came out in conjunction with Comic-Con for Sybil Trelawney? You can look it up on Amazon and pre-order it. I want it so much because it's so stinking cute. She's just... She's just like a delightful hippie. Just, yeah. Um, this chapter was about her, and one of the phrases which I will share with you says she's at least 90% fraud, <laughs> which we all know because, <laughs> yeah, she has like two good prophecies in her career. Um, she is very different from McGonagall, yet they're friends, so they're like the opposite of each other, but they have that bond because when Umbridge tried to kick Trelawney out, McGonagall wouldn't let her. And yeah. And she also talked about naming seers. In the wizarding world, it's kind of become out of fashion now, but some wizarding families take their child to a naming seer who will see their future and discover what they must be and then give them a name. And so obviously like Harry, Ron, like the Weasleys, the Potters, they those kind of families just use regular names that are very more muggle sounding. Um, but like Xenophilius Lovegood, maybe his parents took him to a naming seer because who names their child Xenophilius? Really? Um, chapter four is the last chapter and it is Sylvanus Kettleberg, Kettleburn. Sorry, I'm not good with pronunciation today. Um, and he was the care magical creatures teacher before Hagrid took over. And remember, he wanted to leave to spend quality time with his remaining limbs. I believe, if I remember correctly, he had an arm and part of a leg, or vice versa, um, left when he was done. And he was very much like Hagrid. Hagrid, 
I swear I know these characters backwards and front, but I can't say their names today. Hagrid, he was very much like Hagrid in that he greatly under underestimated what damage certain creatures could do. Um, and he retired to Hogsmeade, and in the Battle of Hogwarts, he did something so sweet. He couldn't get up and fight because, again, the limb thing. But he went up to his attic and threw all of his flobber worms at the Death Eaters as they were going by. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Okay, I feel like I've given away way too many details, and I tried really hard not to. And but there's still so much more to discover in these ebooks. To my knowledge, they are not going to be released as print books, so I did go ahead and just download them because. If that's the only way to get them, that's the only way to get them. Um, they are a fun read, but again, don't go into it expecting a continuation of anyone's story. It's just information. Almost like a nonfiction book, but we know it's fiction because it's in the wizarding world. Um, but they're super quick to read. I sat down and read them in the morning. And yeah, very fun, enjoyable information. And yeah. So definitely don't read them if you haven't read all the Harry Potter books because you will be spoiled for some things, but otherwise, you're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off now. I'm going to stop hitting myself with this wand because I've been doing that the entire video, sometimes out of frame, sometimes in frame. Anyway, so I'm going to let you go. Have a wonderful and bookish day. Happy reading. Adios.